Is this a Joe Sullivan exclusive for the Straight Outta Lair podcast? It's the first time I'm saying Ooh. it. So. so Joe Sullivan is now going to put down the chalk. Flex Lewis, you're straight out the lair. On this episode, I get the privilege to speak with the all-time powerlifting world record holder. He shares his darkest times and the thought process that takes place preceding the heaviest of lifts. And we talk about the joys of victory, the lessons learned from defeat, and the devastation from injury. For the first time, he reveals his next venture and how it will change everything he does with his training. And things get personal when we share our thoughts on an extremely controversial subject. Here's a podcast with a powerful Joe Sullivan. Straight off the lead, joined today by the all-time world powerlifting record holder, my man, my friend, Joe Sullivan. Welcome straight off the lead podcast, my friend. Hey, I'm glad to be here, man. I, you know, you know, I always love coming to Dragon's Lair. I, lo- I love getting to see you, and I finally get down and able to sit and have a conversation with you. So I'm looking forward to this. Yes, yeah, been a, it's been a minute. I know that yeah. we we spoke about it. In fairness to you, uh-huh. it's more me. Uh, hey, it's it's fine. I know. I get it. Yeah, I get it. Um, but it's it's also on me because uh, we've both been busy, you know, Definitely. both had a lot going on. So you're talking about not getting out of meetings until midnight last night, and I had some uh, consultations I had to do at 4.30 this morning. So it's the name of the game, baby. The, the, the life of uh, being a pro plus wearing many hats, right? I, I guess, man. Uh, but what I was doing is, what I was allowing you to do, and this is my, my bullshit, by the way, uh-huh. uh, I was allowing you to get more shit in the tank so we can talk about it. Yeah, see, yeah. Uh, see, see, there's it's, a strategy. It's strategic. A strategy. It's always strategic, man. But but listen, for me, um, a lot of the audience that are watching this um, and a lot of audience that may have seen you but may not know, connect the videos, mm-hmm. Um you went viral a number of years ago. In fact, um, I had seen that video, and I didn't even really correlate you mm-hmm. and that same person together, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, I have seen the incredible strength that you've been putting up and the weights you've been putting up here at the gym. But this video now that's uh, on, on the screen right here of you uh, squatting, what, do you, what is that weight? 600 and what? That, that right there, that was 675 pounds. That was in February of 2018. And the funny thing about this video... Is because well one it, that was my warm up weight that wasn't it wasn't supposed to feel like that wasn't supposed to look like that and obviously the barbell's not supposed to do that shit warm up weight yeah so the that was in prep for the the Kern U S Open in 2018 it was like the big premier powerlifting meet that yeah. year uh, I was I was working up to uh, 700 pound squats that day. Basically asked the gym if I would be cool using that bar. They were like, yeah, it's a Troy Power bar. You're totally going to be good. We've had people use it before. I don't know what happened, but apparently I wasn't. The funny <laughs> thing is, though, you just said it. You 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 know me. We're friends. We, we've known each other for like three years now. But the thing is, I've broken world records. I've... Set, I've set powerlifting records. I've done really done really well, like excelled at my sport. But when this happened, I didn't have a world record. I knew in the back of my mind because that I think that thing has like 20 million views on YouTube now. It was on MTV's ridiculousness. Like it's, it's it's been all over. But I knew I would always be the guy that bent the bar and never known as a guy who broke the world records. And I still have people. All, like to this day, come up and be like, "Man, you you're that guy. You're yeah. that guy." And I'm like, I, "Yes, indeed, I am that guy." So it's crazy though. I met you the complete opposite mm-hmm. because I'd yeah. seen yes. that video, kind of like you know, in, in the montage of life, right? Mm-hmm. And I seen it, never kind of put much thought to it. Of course, you look at it and go, "Oh my god, yeah, move on with life." No, I see you doing all this absolute madness, which we will get a, get into later on the podcast. Um, but then I found out that was you. In fact, my producer, Tyus, was like, that was you? <laughs> and then I was like, that was you? Mm-hmm. Um, so not only, though, did uh, obviously that thing go viral, mm-hmm. but um, maybe the audience don't know this because that clip has obviously uh, gone around the world a hundred times and back, and they may have seen it a few times. But you came out of that with quite a lot of injuries. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly that. And like with with that video, you see it and I seem to get out of it pretty unscathed. Yeah. And I thought I was good. I thought I was okay that day, but I didn't understand what that set up to happen in my body uh-huh. that was that ultimately resulted in me not being healthy in in the context of like being able to train my upper body at all for 
five, six, seven years. So what happened was, if you go, you don't have to pull the video yeah, again. Can, I, but, can we see this again, Tess? But if, if you go, for anybody watching, if you go watch that video again, as I, I come up and you see the bar bend, but it doesn't bend to a, a bow as if it was like a, a specialty barbell, like a buffalo barbell or a duffalo bar, it bends to a point. And mm. that point is a singular spot of pressure that was literally pinching tissue on my back. And as you watch, I rack the one side and obviously I'm like, I have to get out of this. I'm pan I'm not panicking. It's just like, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. So I punch, I think I punch my right hand out from underneath of it. And it leaves all of that pressure on that singular point on my left side for, for a millisecond. Seconds, yeah. Second. But, but, in in that video, th at that same time, my best be my best raw bench press was uh, 575 pounds in the gym, 540 pounds on the platform, and that's raw. That's not with a, a supportive equipment. It's just a t-shirt, like wrist wraps, just doing it myself. But after that video happened, I ended up what what happened was I pinched a well I pinched a nerve it was a disc herniation of my c6 and c7 which bulged and then caused compression injuries to my dorsal scapular nerve and thoracodorsal nerves mm -hmm. those two nerves essentially are main components of the brachial plexus it's that nerve bundle in your upper body that tells your upper body what to do so not that day not even a month later not even two months later but around three months later my pec my delt my uh, my my tricep and my lat all on the left side started to lose feeling. I could I you know some really big words. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I'm not I I have a degree in exercise science and I I, mi I minored in biology and I've done a lot of continuing education. I was going to go to school uh, to get. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for, I, I got accepted into a doctor of osteopathic medicine school, but then I ended up stopping cause I, I like lifting weights more and it's like, follow your dreams. You might have to shit, like so. keep it at my level. Bro, I, don't like, know. I have no idea what you look, just said. Look, look, keep look, it look, at look, my look, level. Look, Tyus, yeah. can, can, Tyus can hang on to the yeah. woods. Nah, I, you, you, dude, you, <laughs> you know fair. me, I'm, I'm like the intellectual meathead. I'm, I'm, du I'm dumb as, Did but I. it's like, I, I have to know some things cause I, the only way, the only way I was able to figure out how to get better from this shit was to learn as much as I have because mm -hmm. if I hadn't done that I'd still be just grinding my forehead into the brick wall in front of me but but the thing the fact of the matter is I went from being able to bench press mid 500s uh, weighing 220 pounds to same body weight not being able to lock out 225 pounds I couldn't do a push-up without my left scapula winging and and become like going going all sideways I still can't feel uh, obviously this is a this is an audio medium but for anybody watching I'm touching my pinky in like the area behind my uh, uh, the pinky on my on my left hand, I still can't feel this. The ulnar nerve is is severed. So I I I with powerlifting, the main lifts are squat, bench, deadlift. My bench and deadlift were in the shitter for years and years and years because I couldn't close this hand. I couldn't engage my tricep, my lap, my pec. I couldn't lock anything out on bench press. Mm. And because of that, obviously, like you you see my physique, I have very very strong, very very large muscular legs. And I do have a big upper body. I'm a big guy, but it's much less developed than in comparison to to my legs. But I, yeah, I got out of that video, and it's uh, it, it hung around for a long time. That injury was one of the most it, that that we, we talked about it a little bit, but it put me in a really dark spot for a while, just because it sort of forced me to consider that I had even at the age of like 26 or 20. 25, 26, whatever, when I was kind of accepting the fact that that was like, I'm really, really hurt and I don't know if I can get through this. Mm -hmm. It kind of forced the the contemplation of, I might I might have done the best I, I ever could do in this. It, it was that like forced retirement consideration where it's like, shit, I may have maxed out the ability uh, for me to do what I wanted to do with this. So you're saying that you, you lost the... The feeling in your arm, your pec, your tricep, mm -hmm. um, was there mus muscle atrophy too? Yes, yeah, yeah. If you scroll back, way, way back on my Instagram, mm. I ha and, and I can get photos of this to tie us and whatnot, uh, but if you scroll back way on my Instagram, like there's, there's photos where like my lat and my tricep, like I raise my arms overhead and it's mm. completely gone. There's still even a little bit of discrepancies between like the, uh, the ability of like to externally rotate and engage the musculature on my left side and, and stuff like that. It's just because it was such a frustrating injury because like, I, I know you, you, you have shoulder issues. Like you, you've, 
banged yourself up throughout the years. But the thing about this particular injury, there was never any pain. It never hurt. It was just as if I literally forgot how to use my arm and my upper body, which was one of the most, it was one of the most frustrating things to go through Mm -hmm. because having been as strong as I was, I would go into the gym and just be like, I know I can do the thing. I know I can do the thing. And I would try to do the thing Mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't go. So it was, it was a very, very just psychologically, it was incredibly difficult to deal with that without that pain or without the injury feeling. So where, where was this first step of recovery for you? Because obviously, you know, you're in a position where you're not only dealing with the injury, but you're also dealing with these mental thoughts that are seeping in. You know, Mm -hmm. all all of us athletes have, if you've gone into the gym, there's a mental fortitude that comes with going into a big leg day, big Mm -hmm. back day. You know, I used to be a pole lifter as well. You know, that was actually my entry point Mm -hmm. before I got into bodybuilding. So I understand that mindset, you know, and I want to talk about that later. But once you kind of get a, a wound to that mindset, it's very hard to then keep on telling yourself, this is just a chapter in my life. This is a season. We'll get through this. This is going to be, you know, a, a rainy day right now, but, you know, there's, there's brighter days coming. What do you want to do to, to get through that time? And, and how long were you in that darkness? Well, that's, that's a loaded question uh, because I could, it's, it's hard for me to answer that without giving you the entire background of my life. Uh, and and I, I, I can, but I don't want to, I don't want to spend an hour talking about it, but, Go ahead, but, my but, the, but the dark, like that type of darkness and that type of struggle, I'm, uh, it's, it's not unfamiliar to me because I, I've, I don't want to say that I've had a hard life because I, I, I love my life. I'm incredibly grateful, incredibly fortunate to be where I am. I have an incredible family. Uh, my parents are the best people that I know. They raised me to be the best man I possibly could be. My dad is my best friend, but when when I was growing up, um, my mom, uh, when she was six years old, diagnosed with type one diabetes, ended up when I was, uh, I believe, eleven or twelve. Uh, she went through complete renal failure. Uh, had like ended up having to be on on dialysis for five days a week for I think three or four years, and ended up like because of this had a lot of financial, a uh, lot of financial struggles. I ended up with my dad. We were we were living out of our car for six months, um, and it was just a it was a very very hard time. But during that entire time, I saw my dad. He was working three jobs in order to support me and my mom. He was he he would he never stopped. He ne- even no matter how bad it get got, and no matter how impossible it seemed. He, he never quit trying. And that was the best example I could, I could ever see as a child. I, I, saw, I saw the man that raised me. He, he, he would choose not to eat at night because we only had enough fruit, food for me. Mm. And I, seeing someone make that decision and, and do that day in and day out and put me in a position to be in the best place I could be to, to succeed and to excel and whatnot... That, that right there showed me that no matter how difficult something may be in, in, at that time, and, and yes, it was still a God, it was such a struggle and such a psychological difficulty for me to deal with because obviously I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to stop doing what I love. But even if that was the fact of the matter, like I can't get better because of this thing, that doesn't mean I can't stop trying. And until I've exhausted every single option, I, I would not stop trying. So I spent that injury with February 2018. I spent tens of thousands of dollars on physical therapy, traction, needling, uh, PRP, um, just a multitude of different of different modalities trying to get better working with this individual, working with that individual, uh, doing all of those things. And I just kept trying. And until I finally, I was talking to Tyus earlier, or, no, I, I don't know who I was talking to, but I was talking to uh, someone about the guy who ultimately helped me get to the point where I was able to overcome the, uh, that injury, and that's that's Jake Benson, who's who's the guy that I train with periodically here. He's my best friend, business partner, and my coach. He was the only guy that we were finally able to narrow down exactly what I needed to change in order to adapt to the new style of training, basically having to revamp my entire lifestyle to overcome that injury. And as, as dark as those times were and as how 
as, as how loud that voice was in my head that made me want to quit, made me want to give up, made me want to say that I can't do this anymore. I already tried to commit suicide when I was 17 years old because I was, I was, I was in the place where I was talking about with like, my mom was sick. My dad I was never home. I was the burden like quote unquote burden because I was the one that they were trying to put through private school. Cause I, li- I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Flint, Michigan is not a good town. What did not want to go to public education there. They were sacrificing all doing all of this thing, all of these things to put me in a position to succeed. And I wanted out when I was 17, I held the gun to my head. I pulled the trigger and it jammed. And if you tell me that like, me being in that position and that happening, that stopping me, this, this thing happening and then me somehow overcoming it, continually getting put in the position or given the opportunities to adapt and overcome, it's just a matter of not stopping. If you treat the, the overcoming of whatever injury or the, the, the victory as an inevitability, it is an inevitability one day. And, and I, just, I just never stopped, you know? And it's, it doesn't make it any easier because I, there were still those nights where I fought, I split my fists on a wall. There's a giant gash in my forehead because I headbutted a concrete pillar because I was so upset during this time period. And it's like I, I live with this scar for the rest of my life because of that decision that I made. But even still, like it, it never made it any easier. But there was always that light at the end of the tunnel, considering that this is an inev- an, is an inevitability as long as I don't give up. And I just never gave up. Oh man, where, where, where do I even go? With that? I, <laughs> I mean, you—you t- you, well, you, a got, lot of you, background, man. You—you you just dive deep, straight into the deep end. And listen, first things foremost, man. Thank you very much for a lot of of that vulnerability and and, and obviously story. Um, and that's kind of cliff notes, right? Mm-hmm. So here we are, seventeen years old. You got a gun against your head. Mm-hmm. It was my my dad's M one nine eleven. So that would have fucked him up because I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> but, first, but first of all, how did you get to that point at 17 years old? I know you mentioned that you felt like a burden, mm-hmm. but there's, there's actually going through that process and then physically having to load a gun or pick it up, put it to your head, and, and literally, did you try and pull the trigger? I pulled the trigger. I, I pulled the trigger. It jammed. I literally like sl- was like, what the f-? And I shot a wall through the ceiling, or I shot a hole through the ceiling after that and that scared the shit out of me but like I couldn't I wish I could tell you exactly what was going through my mind I wish I could but I don't think anyone for anybody watching if anyone's had suicidal thoughts like suicidal ideations or or know someone who committed or tried to commit suicide I don't think they would I don't think they would be able to tell you like oh I was like I was thinking clearly this is what I did you know I I essentially got to a point where and, and again, I don't want any of this to negatively n- paint my parents in a negative light whatsoever because they were, I can't imagine the stress that they were going under or going through throughout, the, throughout that time. But as a 17-year-old kid who, I, I'm an only child, I was, I was, their, only, I was their only kid, I was, a mir- I was a miracle baby too, I was supposed to die as a kid, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just constantly being like, what's up, dude, I'm sticking around, but... um. But I was, I was the only child. I was the, the only one uh, that, that made it. And uh, being the only kid in that environment, watching my, parent, watching my dad struggle to the degree that he did, watching my mom suffer to the degree that she did, and seeing them argue with one another. And again, th- if they're listening to this, because they probably will listen to this, I'm not saying it's their fault at all. Never will. But like as a kid who's impressionable, I see them suffering. I see them... Mm like having all of these negative feelings and being like, not woe is me, but just being like, life is so goddamn hard. And for whatever reason, whether it's my own messed up psychology or, or whatever, I, I was like, somehow I have a, this, this like savior complex where it's like, if I go away, they will be okay for whatever reason. I can't tell you that it was, it was logical or rational or, or feasible in any way. Cause I'm sure it would have broken them. But for whatever reason, I was like, if I go away, they'll, they'll be better. You know, I get, I get emotional talking about this because it's a very, it's a, it's a very difficult perspective for me to acknowledge that I had 
because it's incre- it's an incredibly selfish one from the perspective that I'm in now because I would mu- the the man I am now I would much rather try try to help and try to be here and use my ability and use my presence here to help them facilitate growth safety whatever and not just like leave because looking at it now I was like god how stupid were you dude and and it's like can you imagine how much that would have hurt your dad how much that would have hurt your mom because like I I said to you before we started the podcast my dad's my best friend Mm -hmm. like he's the guy that made me the guy And, and and I can't imagine putting that through him I think about I tell this story and I think about it and it just it breaks my heart that I even potentially put that onto him but but there was no rational thought I was, I was an, I'm an angry dude. I, I get like, you see me train. I turn, I flip the switch I want to talk about that. when I need to, but it's taken me a lot of work to leave that switch off every, in every other aspect of my life, because that moment it was on all the time and I didn't know how to handle it. Dude. Can I ask you this? Do you think that what you've gone through throughout your life, even what you just said to me now as a, a thriving baby, cause I was a thriving baby too, mm-hmm. unthriving baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had a lot of uh, diversity, you know, thrown in my face. Some stories I, I never will tell. In your case, as you've been open and honest and said a lot of different things, do you think there's a, some sort of, you know, guardian angel over you? Because, listen, somebody pull, uh, puts a gun to their head, pulls the trigger, the gun jumps. Was it a second attempt then? And then it, it went off? And what, what was that? It, so that, that's the thing. I, I put it here, pulled it, click, nothing. And I was like... I, I'm in disbelief because I, I thought it would be done. And I was like, what the f-? And I, like, took both my hands and I went like that and, like, smashed. I don't want to break the mic, but, like, smashed my hands together and it shot then. Mm-hmm. And it ju- just that, like, kind of snapped me out of it. And I was like, what the f-? Like, holy, what the f-? Like, why? It just you know? was an instant. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, it was like, holy shit, I almost did that. Holy shit, I just shot a hole in the roof. And it's like, what you do have I to deal with yeah, a hole now? Yeah, you know, and it's the fear of your pet having yeah, to deal yes, with your parents at this yeah. point in time, not what you just went through yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and it, it, that that as stupid as it is, that's like what the reality was for me. It wasn't yeah. the reality of almost blowing my brains out. It was like, oh god, I just fucked the, I just fucked the house up. How do like, I explain this? Yeah, you know, and they say that people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, mm-hmm. they say that they, um, the ones that have survived immediately regretted the moment they stepped off. Did you have that experience? Yeah, honestly, it was, it was, I don't know that I would say it was a, it was a pure regret. It was just a, it was a moment of like, what the was I just doing? Like, it, cause I was more like how you asked me earlier, Flex, you're like, what were you thinking? What got you to that point? That's the answer. I wasn't thinking. I was just so goddamn pissed off and so frustrated and upset in general, didn't know how to handle it, that I was like, it, 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 I'm done. I'm out. And I tried to get out. How did you explain a bullet hole to your parents? I didn't. So no for, one ever noticed this. So, for, so are they finding out about this for the first time? No, I've I've told this story <laughs> okay. on other okay, podcasts, okay. but like, but I think it was like six or seven years ago or something that I, I said this, and I was like, "Hey, FYI, guys, you're gonna you're gonna hear about something," <laughs> and they were like, "What the?" We had a big old conversation because they didn't know that I tried to do that. Six years later, you to, you, you told them about you trying to commit commit suicide. S- six years ago, so that was when I was like twenty. That was like 24, 25 ish. And prior to that, I tried when I was 17. Mm. So they would have found out like seven years after. And that's like now in comparison. So I don't know timelines, but how did they not see the bullet hole? Uh, because it was like in the corner, it was like, it's a little pistol, little caliber pistol, but it like was literally in like the corner and it was like this paneled ceiling and Mm. it just. Wow, okay. I just didn't notice. If there was anything to do with me, I would have gone up there, botched it, put, put, try to make it right, or made it worse. I, then- so, so that no, that that I I, I did that, <laughs> but it was like this. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was like that weird drywall stuff okay. that was like the uh, um, popcorn, like the dress. yeah, like the popcorn oh, right, okay. stuff. So I literally went up there and I I like g- got some of the popcorn and I like shoved it oh in gosh, there, too. and I d- it might still be there. I have no idea. Are you, your parents still in the same house? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, mom and dad, you better check that hole. <laughs> Please now, don't. Now, now Joe's oh, making the big God. bucks. Yeah. He's no, pay, no, he'll God, fill that hole. Jesus, dude, don't, don't, don't do that to me. <laughs> Listen, but. you've obviously got gone through 
you know, uh, obviously a, a life, right? It, and you said you've had a, a great upbringing. You, you've mm-hmm. gone through, you know, what you've gone through. But um, powerlifting is all about turning it on and turning it off. Mm-hmm. Um, over the years, and, and going, going with the words you just told me, you've got better at turning it on and turning it off. And some of these lifts that you're going under are ungodly. I mean, listen, when you've got 800 pounds on the bar, you've got, regardless, it's 600 pounds. I've seen you squat in for reps, stupid numbers. I mean, you've done Tom Platz's record, which I want to talk to you about later mm-hmm. on, but that, that was 525 pounds for reps. When you're going under that much weight, how, how do you have the controlled aggression knowing that you're stimulating yourself for that lift? What is the process? What is the thing that, no, okay, you're... you're I don't know, I can't remember taking myself back, but uh, if you're at the powerlifting meeting, they say, uh, lift us up in, in mm-hmm. X amount of minutes. Pla- platform ready. Platform ready. Yep. Okay, talk me through and, and, le- and tell the audience who have never powerlifted, what is the process of you going from the calm before the storm to know the storm? So for me personally, I used to be, and I'm, I'm all about analogies, so bear with me if I, if I paint a picture here, but I used to be, the type of guy where it was a nuclear explosion as soon as soon as the the, the like they're putting my weights on because the way the way a powerlifting meet will work is like you have there's like 10 lifters in your flight and I'm always the guy near the end because I'm always squatting the most so I see these guys hitting it and I'm starting to like ramp myself up think about like almost your time almost your time almost your time and in in my young younger years like I'm still I'm not old but like when I was starting to do this in my early 20s it was like back in my day eight yeah, years yeah, ago yeah right yeah but <laughs> it was cr- crank it all the way up to 11 immediately and just tur- turn the nuke on and yeah. be like let's go I'm gonna headbutt the bar I'm gonna cuss I'm gonna do, like snort the ammonia do all of this and just ramp it all the way up and use all of that aggression to a to a 10 at all times the thing about that is is that's not always the most sustainable thing so this is a, like like we were saying i i've gotten better at it and and it's a matter of incorporating that that ability to control the aggression and turn that nuclear bomb from something that's like sweeping and all encompassing and turning it into a laser focused device and making it such a like turning this firestorm into a focalized spo- point where it's just like i'm only using this using this when I absolutely need to and exactly as much as I need to to accomplish this task. Because even in the even in the gym, like you've seen me, I think there was a, one day when I was, I hit 804 for a triple in here and it was like, I'm joking around. I'm having a good time the whole time. But it's about right, like five minutes before the headphones go in and the best way to describe it isn't so much me becoming anything different or like putting myself any in any position mentally that I'm that I'm not like it's not me playing it's not me like doing something and like becoming something else for a moment that's the only time where I feel truly as though I'm a hundred percent me and when you're in this time when I'm in that time and, and, and would you would you say this is the dark time I don't know if I would say like yes and no. It's it's yin and yang. It's the contrast of both things. It's it's the purest form of of emotion that I can describe, whether it's positive or negative. Mm-hmm. Because I like think about back 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 in in your body built like the, when when you're in the middle of your Olympia wins, like not not like seven time you've won, you've won like three, and you have these guys that are chasing you and you're in the gym and you're depleted and you know that you know that like you could probably coast this one session and it wouldn't matter that much but you remember there's guys out there that are breathing down your neck that they they will not let you off the hook you have to put every every effort everything inside of you to the forefront to work as hard as you can to accomplish what you want that those sets where you're doing Let's say you go for 10, but you're like, let's do 15. Let's do 20. Put yourself in that quote unquote dark place. But I don't know for me if I would call it dark. I thought it was dark Mm. when I was a 17 year old kid. I thought it was dark when I let it be 
that level of negative and and angry and and like just volatile but it's it's taken a lot of work and taken a lot of skill it's less volatile now and it's less dark it's more silent where there's nothing there except me i i've heard it being described as a uh, some some sort of weird bliss yeah would you say that i i would i would because it's like you you've never you've never been a runner have you i used to sprint for my country okay i had no idea Mm. well so but even still like you've never done endurance running right (laughs) right and you say that and you say that and you've hated every step didn't you I mean, over a hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Every see, one of them yeah, extra. Yeah. yeah. See, and and because that that's the way. What I'm saying is, people have talked about runners high to me. I've had runners high many times. See, okay. Yeah. See, I never have. Really? I've ne- no. I ran. I, I ran 16 miles. Uh, when I when I was a wrestler in college, mm. and the, every step I was like this. I hate this shit. Wow. So I've actually had runners high walking really fast. I used to do cardio. Um, a couple of cardio sessions back in the day for the British Championships, and, and for me, I do a lot of outdoor cardio. Uh-huh. But I would walk so fast, and it's raining. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have um, I would have enough clothes on that only my face is focused. My hoodie would be over my head. I've got a rain jacket on because it was pissing down with rain. We had no treadmills. Right, yeah. So a lot of hills, and I you took them for advantage. But when you're going through these dark lanes, you see this, br- this little uh, bit of light. We would call them in the United States Magazalis or mm-hmm. Rapers Lane or shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's an overgrow of, of trees and there's a a muddy path. But this muddy path is running alongside a freeway or something like that. And that's what a lot of people in these, uh, you know, in the steel factories would use to go to work in the morning. So I was down there, 5 a.m., pitch black. The only thing I could see was me getting into it on the other side. I could see my, my feet, but my focus was all the way down there. That focus and aiming for that light. I was walking in a straight line. I couldn't see where the was going. I was just aiming for the light. But uh, many times, the only way I would describe it is I've been in a runner's high, but it's a walker's high. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever that listening to this has ever uh, experienced that too, but I've gone so fast that I'm in my head, my body's moving, and I'm like, oh, shit, look at this. I am. Um, it was feel, felt like I was having an outer body experience. Flo- floating. Floating. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then the, the thought of me, I'm never going to do that again. It's happened. But it's never when you, you're hoping. It mm-hmm. always happens when you're so focused. So kind of segue from, from, mm-hmm. from where you started. No, no, but but, I, no, but I love this. Right. So, yeah, so you say you've never had it. But, but again, sorry to go back to your story. But yeah, I just want to say that uh, I've had it from walking. Right. But, but, that's, but that's the point right there. You're focused on that singular thing. When I, when I was running, my, the reason I brought that up is because I've never experienced runner's high because I don't think I've been able to put myself in that, that void, that stillness, that flow state, whatever, mm. that allows you to get that runner's high. You were able to do it when you were walking because you were focused on that singular spot. The only time I've ever experienced any feeling like that or the only time I've I've been able to achieve that level of flow state or just like nothingness floaty but like doing shit at the same time is when I'm squatting. That's crazy. That, and it, and it doesn't make any goddamn sense no. because like the pre, I my I have the all-time world record. It's it's 851 pounds. Like I talk to people about it and it's like yeah, I, f- I feel my spine compress. I feel like the pressure of that. It's unbelievable on my back. But when I'm coming, when I'm coming up out of the bottom, I have my vision fixed on a singular point. And the best way to describe it is nothingness. Because even though I have this unbelievable amount of weight on my back, the closest thing that I can describe it feeling as is floating. And and I I don't I don't get runners high. I haven't gotten runners high, but I've gotten lifters high, squatters high, or whatever. And that's that's why it feels like for me, at, at least me personally, when I'm in that flow state where it's this combination of of it, it, it's this weird amalgamation of anger and happiness and euphoria and like just p- the purest form of emotion. That's the one time where I get to experience that euphoria that I feel like is the most perfect bliss in life. And that's why, that's why I do it so much. That's why I, I'm a pressure junkie. 
Yeah. I love doing hard shit because it just, it, fe- it, it feels like you're going to die during it. But like you get through it in that little moment after that's the best feeling in the world, man. So you're training really for that one, two, three seconds mm-hmm. of, of that bliss. We're, yeah, we're, we're, we're all addicts in, d- in different forms, man. Like I'm just, I'm just addicted to that little bit of pressure and, yeah. and yeah, I, I am. And it's, it, obviously, I, lo- I love all the things that I've achieved. I'm proud of all the things that I've achieved. I have another competition coming up in, in October that I'm very much looking forward to, and I want to achieve more there. But it's not about that for me. Like, I've, I've talked I've talk about it all the time. It's like those goals aren't the things that I'm in this for. It's, it's, that, it's that grind. It's that process. That Like, I still have fun with this. And if I didn't have fun with it, if I didn't feel that bliss, I wouldn't do this shit anymore. I want to talk though about, you know, the 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 time period between you getting your injury, mm-hmm. career threatening, where many people would have laid down. Hey, look, this is me. That's that's uh, you know that viral video mm-hmm. will become that that trophy. You know, that's the one that gets shown at the barbecues, and mm-hmm. you know what I mean. The mm-hmm. ones, hey, this is me. Oh, yeah. back, back in my day, back I was, in my I was, day, I was strong man. Yeah, look at yeah. me. Uh, but that never was the case. That you didn't want that to define you, not that you went out to to look for that viral video that mm-hmm. keeps on giving back, because I've got a few of them out there too, which right, you know about. Right, yes. Um, yep. But not that they they define you, but it might be the entry point, right? Now you've got a lot of people who have been aware of you from different, you know, from different things, amalgamating everything, joining everything together. This this time period between you getting injured to then breaking the all time world powerlifting tra- record what that was that time period three years what was it uh three years yeah yep. so in that three-year time period you got back on the horse mm-hmm. um you mentioned you met up with jake mm-hmm. you and jake put the protocol together um that got you back into into steed again because when you and i met i remember you telling me about your your injuries and your nerve impingements and and various different we had various different conversations mm-hmm. But um, not once did you say you had herniated discs. You just had some nerve impingement. And you kind of like, in a sense, downplayed it. Um, Was that your, was that a psychological tool that you kind of didn't allow other people to to truly know the extent of the injury that that weren't in your close circle? Because you could have just said, hey, listen, yeah, I'm squatting this mad amount on, on Thursday. But, you know, two years ago before you knew me, Flex, or three years ago, whatever it was at that point in time, um, this happened. And, and no once did you say you had a, a career threatening injury. It was just a injury, just like all of us guys who are at that top level have walk around and we kind of just put on put on the hat and, and, and just get on with work. Is that is that something that you kind of uh, psychologically don't allow anybody else to see and know about? I know you've spoken about it, but but mm-hmm. in meeting, I, I, this is this is kind of new things when I'm I'm learning from you. You know. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. and it's, I've been I've because I I've been vocal like I I have no I have no I have no shyness or shame or whatever. I don't I don't really like hold back when I talk to people, but I think what you're picking up on, I don't even know if I would say that I've done that intentionally, but thinking about it, I I have absolutely done it with people because well, you I, it with me. yeah, I don't. And I just, I, I do that with in general because I don't think I lead with that information because I don't define myself by that information. Like mm. I, I, yes, I'm, I, I, I was injured. I had a, I had, it, it's, it's a spinal column injury. So like it, it was same outcomes as someone having like uh, dealing with like par- paralysis. Like one of the things we did in rehab was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, rehabilitation exercises like mirror therapy that people would experience when they actually like lose like someone who is paralyzed. Come where, on. Yeah. So like, w- one thing we did is I would wear, I think, I think I talked to you about this at some point cause I was wearing long sleeves in the gym cause I have tattoos. So in order to differentiate between my left and right arm, I would wear long sleeves so I could literally trick my brain. I would hold a dumbbell in my right hand with free hand, like left hand free and look at myself in the mirror doing upright rows because that's like full scap- scapula elevation and depression and very slow tempo, very controlled. Doing it with only load in my right hand, nothing in my left hand, but because of the inverse in the mirror, it looked as though 
that like visually appeared that the left hand was doing the work in the mirror. And I would literally talk to myself in my head. Like this is your, this is your left shoulder activating. This is your left scapula moving. This is yada, yada. And, and trick myself, use that like visual discrepancy to actually rehab and train. Cause there's, there's cross communication between like the different sides of the brain uh, is like, if you ever tore a bicep or hurt your shoulder, people are like, Oh, you don't want to train one side. Cause you're going to become imbalanced. It's re- recent evidence. Well, not even recent, but like well-known evidence has shown that if you train the uninjured side, there will be like 15 to 25% stimulation to the opposing side in, in conjunction with it. So, so, Actually, a doctor yeah. told me this when yeah. I broke my elbow. Yep. And I nearly lost my arm. Yep. I nearly had my arm. So he's watching this and hearing this before. Um, I nearly had my arm amputated when I was very young. That's how I got into pow- uh, bodybuilding, my powerlifting. I, I, th- I think I, I think you told me that yeah. way back. Yeah. And, and thankfully for a doctor who saved my arm, um, I got back into the gym and he was like, I, I got back, um, uh, you know, back into, uh, I would say just doing some lifting, I think at the time. Um, but he told me the same thing. It's like, do not not lift. He goes, uh, you lifting the opposite side of your body will aid in the recovery. And listen, I'm coming from, you know, a small town in Wales. Um, and the knowledge that, that this doctor had back then, I mean, I was 15. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Uh, obviously, a lot of people now are, are showing scientific, you know, studies that are that, mm-hmm. that are back both what you and I are saying up. But at that point in time, this was kind of this guy's, I would say, preference, right? Or what mm-hmm. it would be like his uh, own expertise of, of what's going on. But um, again, the injury, I know we've, we've kind of, uh, I, I've not exactly uh, guided you in the right uh, direction. You're well, I, this I, question. Got, I got You talk like I do. I yeah. get it. I got you. But with, with going back to that timeline of you now getting back into the gym, this all-time world record is in its sight, at what point in time, in that time period, in the three years, did you realize that you now were back in steed, you were going to break that all-term world record? So the, it, I knew that there was potential there throughout the entire training cycle leading up to it. I, 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 had, like, I had made enough progress to, just based on function that I, I felt that things were getting better because there was, a, there was a, a time here in the gym where I was, uh, I, with due to the injury, it specifically affected the long head of my tricep, which is more predominantly used in like overhead tricep stuff. So I wasn't able to, I, there, my shoulders are small compared to everything else because I haven't been able to train shoulders like with overhead movements for uh, up until like a year ago, pretty much. Yeah. But um, I... I was doing close grip incline because Jake had me doing that in periodically just to test. And I, he was like, work up to a heavy triple. And I kept putting weight on, I kept putting weight on, I kept putting weight on. And then I put 315 on and I was like, am I going to be able to do this? I'm like, holy shit, I'm getting excited. And I, I did it. And it like stopped and I grinded through the first rep and it came up and I grinded through the second and I grinded through the third. And I was like, holy shit. I'm back, you know, and even though that wasn't directly related to the squat, just because that victory was in itself, like overcoming that particular aspect of the injury, I was like, I'm here again. I got it, you know, and then leading up in that training cycle, I remember the the all time world record because this the all time world record. I broke it the first time in uh, September of 2020, and it was set at 820, 821 pounds. And in that training cycle, I hit 777 for a double. I hit it for two reps. And I knew because just based on my own strength and my own, like my knowing my own body and my own skill when it comes to like top end strength expression, I knew hitting that I was like, I'm going to do it. Mm. If I ha- if I have a good day, if I prepare properly and set myself up, it's going to happen. And then subsequently just kept, I've done it every every year since, but that was that moment where it was like, even though it wasn't directly related to the squat, I was like, I'm on the track. I'm back in the saddle, man. I'm doing the things that are supposed to, that are going to get me there. It was a personal victory. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So you were not the, there's been a few times in the gym where I've seen you bench in Mm -hmm. and you put up some, you know, some, well, shit ton of weight (laughs) in the bench and you've come out of that as if you were in a powerlifting meet and you just broke mm-hmm. your own all-time world record mm-hmm. 
And now I realize that's exactly why the timeline. Mm-hmm. And had I been aware of this back then, I would have kind of, I know how I am. I would have got in your head and I would have been more, I would have been more appreciative of the battle you're going through. And I would have shared the victory as a bystander a lot more. Um, and I'm kind of, kind of guilted now that I'm listening to this and hearing about this that I wasn't aware of this because listen, you, you and Brie, which I want to talk about Brie also later mm-hmm. on, um, both of you guys are, are faces you at the gym. You know, you fly the flag for us and, and represent the uh, represent the Dragons Lair um, as the powerlifting faces. You know, you you guys are uh, Team Dragons Lair, my guys, mm-hmm. the, the powerlifting team, and uh, we'd see you guys uh, just doing incredible feats of strength. So the so the viewers that are listening to this they understand. There's many times I've walked into the gym. Or oh, there's been many times when I'm in the office and I just hear this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what the... F-? And as you can see behind you, Joe, I've got my cameras mm-hmm. in the gym. And, I, and I've been, as we've been talking, I've just got this habit of periodically looking at my cameras because this is what I do. So when I see that Joe Sullivan has the bar loaded and you're, you're putting the weights on and sometimes, you know, you're... You're not even um, there's certain. I know when you're going up for the big lift because there's a there's a builder process. Even mm-hmm. if I'm watching the camera, you will shut the gym down. And what I love about the Dragons Lair is, regardless if you're a day passer, if you're a, a member, if you're an athlete at an, an elite level, they've all turned in the middle of their workouts and shouted from afar, gathered around. Whether you're aware of it happening, because again, you're in that that bubble, that zone. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, when you come out of it, what, what what is it like to be in a in a kind of a what is a public gym? It's a very unique public gym, I guess. But mm-hmm. what is it like for you to be putting out that numbers and then look around? You've got guys like you know Sean Merriman from you know the NFL legend himself. You've got guys who are UFC fighters. You've got guys who are the top boys in bodybuilding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all looking over to you. Go, jeez, is that is that motivation or is that more of a distraction? More close to motivation, but I wouldn't even call it either. It's just because, again, going back to what what we started this with, you said that you felt as though you were somewhat, like you felt guilted in the sense of not being able to share in that joy Mm. that I, that I was experiencing when it comes to, when it comes to like that little personal, the little personal victory on the, on the bench and then on the bench and then on the bench. But there's a reason that I don't lead with, hey, I'm Joe Sullivan, and I had this damn near career-ending injury, and I've overcome it. I'm not that injury. That's not my identity. I don't need, like, it, it do, I don't want it to sound callous, but I don't need that from you. I don't need that from anyone. The reason that I do this is for me, and it's the, vic- the victory is mine and my own. And that's why I love it so much and why I, I thrive so much on that personal the aspect of personal accountability and personal determination and perseverance it's it's that that's it's whether i win or lose it's all me mm-hmm. and 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 either the, all the credit goes to me or all the blame goes to me that's why i i love this the aspect of individuality when it comes to powerlifting bodybuilding strength sports in any in any capacity but I mean, who isn't going to be motivated, motivated being like training at a gym like this? There's a reason that because there's no shortage of powerlifting gyms in in Las Vegas. There's no shortage of gyms and fitness centers in Las Vegas, whether you're a powerlifter, a bodybuilder or whatever kind of professional athlete. But there's a reason people come to Dragon's Lair. And that and the reason one of the reasons or one of the biggest components of the reason is exactly what you described. It's that support, whether it's known or unknown. Everyone here knows who we all are. We all know what we're going for and what, what, like a general sense of what our goals are. So when I'm working up to a heavy set and I have somebody that I, I've, I've never talked to before and be like, Oh man, that like what you got today, you know, like you, you good, you need anything like just that type of thing that, that doesn't go unnoticed. And it's one of the coolest feelings on the planet. And it's why we fly the flag. So, so proud because it's not, it doesn't feel like just a gym here. And I don't want to say that it's a family because it's not like, I, I'm not one of those guys where it's like, oh, the gym family and whatnot. But it's 
camarad- camaraderie, and we all share. It, it's like, again, I'm w- I'm way too big on analogies, but you you know you know a prism. Like you shine a light through a prism, and like if you hit it at a certain angle, it's like red, and then it's purple, and then it's blue, and whatever. We all have that same light inside of us, whether it's that like bliss or that passion or whatever the thing is that we're going for, whether you're the NFL player, or the UFC guy or the power lifter, it's that same light deep down. Just because I'm a power lifter, it comes out different. It comes out in power lifting, in the power lifting spectrum. It comes out for, for Sean, it comes out football and, and con- like continuing mentorship and whatnot. For you, it comes out, it was bodybuilding. Now it's, it's business development, like podcast shit, all the other stuff that you have going on and you kicking ass with the new, uh, uh, the new group challenge thing that you're doing, like all, all that stuff. Like it's that light is the focus and the reason the Dragon's Lair is so goddamn unique and so cool is because everybody in here has that light and we all see it within one another. And that's why people will stop and watch me lift, why people will stop and watch Bree lift, why people will stop and watch anyone who walks through these doors, whether it's like you can smell it when there's something going on and you're like, you're doing something today and you're going for something and and it's infectious. So it's not motivating. It's just, it's just energizing. It's cool. It's, it's, it's the thing. And, and truly, you do wear that as a badge of honor. And I'm, I'm, I'm very shocked that today you're not even wearing a dragon's lair shirt. I, th- I, I, w- I was going to, but I was like, nah, I'm gonna. And of with all that. days, too. I know, nah, nah. You don't get. You, you look you, good. You, you look you good. Get, you get enough free advertising. Yeah, you look me, good. You better not talk <laughs> shit or start showing your legs. You told me, don't show. He said, don't show my feet. Well, it's, it's because I'm sitting in this. I'm, fi- I'm, I'm about as tall as this motherfucker <laughs> over here. And my feet are sticking straight out because I'm sitting like, all the way back in this thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're, we're on that little high chair check, <laughs> the high chair kick, but. Um, Joe, honestly, there's nothing better for me to, to, to walk out into the gym and feel like there's something going on. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't know if you, you have this, you know, because you're in that shoes maybe, but for me, when I'm walking out to the gym or walking into the gym and I feel this, this aura that something is going on, um, it happens very frequently, but it always happens when you're lifting big. So whatever that is, I love, I don't question it, that a true, honestly, true to form, there is this aura that, that surrounds the gym when somebody's doing something big. And that's one of the reasons why I love having you in the gym, because not only are you a, an exceptional power lifter, but also an exceptional human. You know, you are very well educated, very well worse, versed, we have a lot of different people that come through these doors from all parts of the world, powerlifters, bodybuilders, whatever they are. But when they get to meet you and I get to hear the feedback from people that have met you, nothing but class act. And I think what happens when people see the lifts that you do, I think they expect some sort of attitude that comes from that. Because when you're lifting, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of... Whatever it is. I, I mm-hmm. would say, you know, whatever that dark place is for you. I know for, for me, I I get such into a dark place of trauma. I, I stimulate a lot of shit to get that aggression up. That's your job. You've been able to now control that, as you said, sort of use it as a laser focus. If I was to go into a big lift, I call it Pandora's box. I'm able to pop the lid in it, put it into a set. As long as you allow me to just walk it off after... My training partners know I get out of the set, they'll say, <clears throat> I don't need, you know, everybody kind of cheering or anything like that because that, that process for me is more of a calm down. I've seen you do a lift, stop slapping hands. You, you go from that aggressive guy in that lift to then snap a finger, you're back to Joe Sullivan and sitting right opposite me right now. That is a very... That's just a gift, mate. That's a gift. And, and obviously, I know you've been able to home in on that throughout the years, but that also separates you from the pack because, you know, as I said, this gym is full of tourists. They see that big lift and they, you know, some people are, uh, uh, they don't have the respect element of letting somebody have that conformity after a lift. Some people are in your grill literally after, mm-hmm. seconds after. Um, so for you then to slip, snap back into it and, and be Joe Sullivan and just be that smiley guy is, is, is a testament to you. And there's really no 
question I'm asking you. It's just more so seeing what you've been able to achieve in this gym, let alone outside of this gym in competitions. And the you as a, a poster boy for powerlifter, you know, I give you all the props in the world. And, and for all the powerlifters that are listening right now all around the world, truly this guy is such an ambassador for the sport of powerlifting. How you walk, talk, conduct yourself, educated, educating others. You've brought in people that are in your field to the gym. You know, powerlifters are probably may not even step in, step foot in you because, you know, sometimes powerlifters stick to powerlifters mm-hmm. places, bodybuilders stick to bodybuilding places. But for us here at the gym, I, I, I try to work hard to tick a lot of different boxes. And, uh, and as I said, you've brought a lot of people in here who are fans of yours just to meet you, come and see you here, that have no interest in the bodybuilding side of things. And, and for me to you, mate, that, that is, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to have athletes like yourself here, not only representing yourself, but you represent the gym as well. So thank you for me to you, my friend. Well, I, I appreciate it, dude. Like for, and, and we've had conversations like this before, and I, I do appreciate it, but I have to say, like, and, and I, I told you this last week, and I'll, I'm glad to say it again on the podcast, but it's, it's a testament to you too. Because the story that I can tell when it comes to this is like there's I talk about how, how the energy is different. There's so, the, the, the light that everyone possesses in this gym and why it's so special and why it's so unique and why it's always going to be so special and unique. But that light comes from the man up top from the leader there's a reason that you have those in you've you've caused that gravitational pull of people to come here and want to be surrounded by that because when we, Briani and I first walked into the gym we, it was we we for when we first moved out here we literally lived like five minutes that way down down blue diamond and it was like okay close gym we'll check it out see what happens like I was I wasn't had, didn't have a competition plan. I was just kind of in my off season, just moving, figuring it out. Post COVID, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. We we come in, we come in here, and it was like, hey, holy shit, that's Flex Lewis. Like I, I'm, I, I'm not bodybuilding isn't my world. Like I knew who you were, but I wasn't like, oh my god, Flex Lewis. It's Such a like, liar. Yes, he was. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. But, he kind of wept. That, he wept <laughs> yeah, a little yeah, bit on my yeah, shoulder. Yeah, a little bit. But anyway, yeah. we won't talk about yeah. that. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. We, we 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 will just use that as a yeah, the the jumping <laughs> off point. But but so we walk in here and. And the first thing Flex says to me is, well, not the first thing, but obviously we do the introductions and whatnot, just like talk and talking about how it's a great spot, like love training here. Like we're going to sign up. It, it sounds good. Sounds great. And he was like, well, if you guys are power lifters, what's, what is one thing that we could like do here that would be a little bit more uh, uh, like f- fortuitous for your training? Like what would benefit your training? And in powerlifting, they use uh, competition combo racks. It's a, it's a bench and and squat rack combined and you essentially can like break them down like you, they're different uses depending on what you want out of them and I was like okay at some point just to keep it consistent like that because that's what I compete on I'd like to be able to train on that some point get a combo rack like no rush at all I don't have anything I don't have anything on the books like we'll talk about it later like maybe we can talk about different types or whatever and then two weeks after this Bree and I walk into the gym and Flex is like hey how's this one and he has a brand spanking new Arsenal combo rack that was probably, I don't know, it was expensive as I'm sure because it's super amazing. It's the, it's one of the best type out there. And he's like, hey, is this one good enough? And I'm like, yes, it's good enough, dude. But like you as the leader, the fact that everyone can see and, and so plainly tell that you not only care so much about the gym as a business, but you care so much about the gym as as an experience, as a, as a home, as a home base, as a, as a place for that camaraderie and that light to be flourished and like uh, c- catered to. It's infectious, and it's it's e- it it makes it so easy for me to continue to train here. When sometimes there's other powerlifting gyms that I could I could go to, and and it'd be just as well. But there's. It, it, it makes it so easy to want to be here, want to be in the Dragon's Lair, want to feel that energy, feel that aura, and be a part of it. And and a huge amount of that credit goes to you, dude. Like, oh. it does. It, it, it wouldn't work. The, the, the All of the things that we as members, as, as like the characters that make up this gym, wouldn't work and wouldn't mesh as cohesively as it does without you to, to guide that. Well, 
first things foremost, thank you very much for the compliment. But for me, I've gone into this not as a gym owner, right? I've gone into this with the mentality of being an athlete. I know we've mm-hmm. kind of spoken about this a few times. And and, and listen, for everybody who's listening to this on Spotify and watching this on YouTube, um, Joe is one of my favorite uh, people in the gym, um, not just, as I said earlier, for all the things I mentioned, but you have truly created events here at the gym. You have, you've come to me and Justin and Ali and said, hey, listen, um, I got the world pole. I got a world championship coming up in the next number of months, and I want to be doing some trainings. But I thought, you know, I want to get some sort of fun training around um, and thrown in. I'm thinking of both doing this. So for us at the gym, we love the fact that you keep on creating, you know, uh, these uh, I don't know the shows for the for the members, yeah. shows for the fans. So as you know, you can't just tell me, hey, I'm gonna squat in this day heavy. Joe knows now. If he tells me something, I'm going to make it into the production. Mm-hmm. It should be. There's many times where Joe's turned up and he has really no clue about this until now. Where he has said, Flex, I'm going to be squatting big next week on Wednesday or whatever it would be, right? I was like, What day? Okay, what time? And then Joe turns up as a crowd waiting for him. The because I want you to be appreciated and feel appreciated. I want you to feel like this is home. I also want you to know that we. We, we love the fact that you, like I said, fly the flag. Um, and one of these such events that you put on was uh, you trying to beat Tom Platz's record. And mm-hmm. I think, that, how long has this record stood for? Since 1993. 30 years. Shh. Incredible. So Joe came to me and Justin and said, hey, listen, I'm thinking about um, doing an exhibition, putting a, a charity to this uh, so we can do a little bit of a what would it be a like pass a another hat yeah, yeah a little bit of a, a, a money drive for a charity and you can talk all about this um, and I was like absolutely absolutely let's do this so you know we kind of uh, put it together we told the gym members we started pushing it on, on Instagram and uh, to my dismay and to my shock we had so much pushback from it which blew my mind and you you are a world champion powerlifter going for what is, you know, arguably a record that may not even be beat, but yet should be attempted. Every record should be attempted mm-hmm. to be beaten, even my seventh time. If somebody got to six, I would be standing up in the audience clapping for that seventh person, seventh mm-hmm. victory. I put that bar up high for it to be beat. And if it doesn't get beat, great. But again, that records are meant to be attempted. And that's what you kind of said, it's like, hey, listen, I am not going to be, I, nor am I a bodybuilder, I'm a powerlifter, but I want to try and attempt this. This is fun, this is for charity. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, we had a barrage of messages saying it's the most craziest of stuff. And um, yeah, take us back to that. June 5th of last year, yep. we set this up. Yep, and and it was a blast. Believe me, I don't, I don't regret it at all. It was awesome. It was so much fun. Uh, and it really, like, honestly, I can safely say that that was not, not, in, not in terms of, like, o- overcoming adversity or whatever, but just sheer work yeah. and the way that we approached it, that was probably the hardest training cycle of my life. Just because of the amount, like, the cardiovascular demand. And I'm not, I am not meant to be an aerobic endurance guy. That is not what I am genetically predisposed to do by any means. So it was very, very difficult for me to pivot my training and do, like, I was doing things where it was, like, the one of the hardest sessions, I did six sets of ten on squats at 435 pounds with 60 seconds rest. I remember these that, sessions. Dude, it was... You were gassed. Otherworldly. Like, every goddamn day I was in here doing that <laughs> stuff, sitting on the assault bike, like, six days a week, just killing myself doing that shit. But it, it was awesome. And, and like you said, like, I'm the type of guy where I have... I have the world records in in the one rep max for the squat. I want to see someone best that at some point. I want to bring my best and put it out there. And if someone can challenge it, by all means, go do so. I I encourage people to do it. It was very, very odd to experience the amount of, 
I don't want to call it hatred because it oh, wasn't. It, 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 there were there was a lot of vitriol and a, a a good bit of anger from the bodybuilding community, and and just fans in general for I the. It was just a mixture of yeah, people who didn't want to see beat. Yeah, and and it people who didn't know me, you mm. know, because like I'm not when like you said when I went into it, I wasn't like these bodybuilders like blah blah blah. It's like I have all the respect in the world mm. for for people that get on stage. It's it's the same light through a di- through different angle of the different prism. Prism. Why am I going to shit on that? Mm. But it was a big old rep challenge. I. I am a pressure junkie, like we talked about. I like doing hard shit, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna try to do this and and put raise some money for a uh, uh, donate America, which is what like my my, my mom had uh, kidney failure. She ended up getting a kidney pancreas transplant in 2005 mm-hmm. that saved her life. So if if you're not an organ donor, be consider being an organ donor. That it can you can save lives. Like it's just easy to do on your driver's license. Like. That's what we raised money for, and we raised like six thousand dollars for that. It was awesome. It for was a, so, so goddamn cool. For I, an exhibition in the for gym. an exhibition, six liter- grand. Yeah, yeah, I and and I ended up not being able to not not surpassing the goal. I hit five. I hit twenty reps at five hundred and twenty five pounds, and I I just wasn't able to get there. I ended up passing out under the weight. Uh, I think I can't. I think Ali uh, catch me caught me. Uh, I'm not sure. Then, like, Briani cut my knee sleeves off, and I was laughing and joking on the floor. You but are. it was like, it was it was a blast, man. And it was just, it was so shocking to me that people were so upset about it because it was like, I'm not, I'm not walking up to Tom and like slapping him in the face. It's just like he did his thing. That's badass. Let yeah. me do my thing. I'm I want to be badass. I don't think it was Tom. Obviously, no, you know, was, you know, no, my, you know my relationship. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I, Tom is, uh, Tom is an idol of mine, and. Um, I don't have any direct conversation with him. I'd love to because one of the things I've I've always wanted to do before the end of uh, my uh, my time on Earth here is have have a, a cheeky little session with Tom Bla- Tom Platts. You know my my idol, the guy who changed my my life uh, at twelve years old when I found that book. Um, mm-hmm. I've only had short dialogue with him. In fact, the, the last time him and I had a conversation was literally before I walked backstage for the 2018 Mr. Olympia, or my last Mr. Olympia. So I don't know if that was eerily bittersweet. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But imagine that. Right? I'm coming in from crazy. from the street into the Orleans up mm-hmm. the street now, you know. Um, and there's there's a, uh, a security checkpoint when you go through the backstage back in the Orleans. It's a, kind of like a hold import metal detectors mm-hmm. and stuff before you go back into the athletes area. And there's a double doors back there for all the athletes who have competed in Mr. Olympia in the Orleans. You guys will know this. It's the entry to a long hallway. Unless you have a specific uh, access point, or access cards, you can't get back there. So Tom was standing right by them double doors. Mm-hmm. And I'm walking in, I get through that crowd that's always congregating outside the doors, waiting for the for the show to uh, to start. Shook my hands, got through the door. I'm like, oh, yes, you know, kind of like, okay. I'm in my zone, I see Tom Platts. I'm in my zone. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, I'm not trying to fanboy out, right? I'm like trying to be like, okay, you know, I, I don't know what you do the day of a powerlifting show, but for mm-hmm. me, I'm kind of going through this. I think it's just this hamster wheel of various different things, you know. It's more of not allowing myself to destroy my mental state of nerves. Exactly. You so, you don't you don't you don't want to blow your load too early. Yes. Yeah. And I nearly blew my load when yeah, I see no, Tom Platts. No, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sound bite. <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> Save that forever. <laughs> um but you know, I seen I seen Tom and of course he gave me this incredible mini speech that Tom mm-hmm. only can do. And uh Man, it was. I couldn't even tell you what he said. I just yeah. stood and I but, looked but it through it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it it was words yeah. that uh-huh. that. So, for me, to get Tom into the gym, to get Tom to be in your next attempt at this, with them words of encouragement that he gave me, I think you'd be an absolute animal in breaking that record next I, because yeah. I wanted to find. The, 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 let me just cl- wrong word. Let me just clarify this situation because you and I have spoken about this off camera, and I want to make sure that the audience members know. Not once did you want to make sure that there was any disrespect shown on Tom 
Tom's record or any of his people that are looking after the Tom Platts brand. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, I wanted to put Tom, this record, and I wanted to re, I would say, undust this this record that stood for 30 something years because it was coming up to the anniversary of this mm -hmm. record and that's one of the reasons why you, you wanted to do this to put it back in the eyes of the public to put it back in the eyes of the body uh, public and also bring knowledge to the fact that this record is around because listen there's new generations that are coming into the sport every single year every single month every single week every single day a lot of the people don't even know the history of the sport they wouldn't even know who Tom Platz is so I feel in the position I'm at, at right now and in I need to make sure that these legends of the sport who have paved the way for the life that I've been able to live, the life that all these other people are able to live now through social media, I think they should have the roses put at their feet as they're still on this earth. And, and you're of the same ideology. That said, June 5th of last year, with all this stuff that was going on, all the drama that was being thrown into your face, you still went into that record. You Sorry, you still went into that lift to a, to break that record, attempt to break that record, and yet still put that mad respect on Tom. Mm -hmm. And and everybody was trying to get in your head. There was even people that were disrespectfully talking about your significant other, mm -hmm. Bree, trying to get her, her riled up too. There was a lot of conversation that was going on. Um, but the bottom line is that... Not once did you want to put disrespect on this on this record, and I wanted to make that clear. So, as I said, there's no question you or anything like that, unless there's anything else that you wanted to add to that. But I will say that you trained your ass off for just this exhibition. There was no award, there was no prize, there was just you putting yourself into the ground, attempting a unbelievable record that has stood, as I said, for thirty years, which you passed out doing. Mm -hmm. So for me to you, my friend, I think that just shows your mental fortitude on, on everything. And no once did you allow the, the negative uh, comments and, and uh, you know, vocal voices of, of, in some cases, some, you know, people of, of significance to, mm -hmm. to get into your head. So kudos to you, my friend. Yeah, well, thank you, man. And that's, it, it, it doesn't, that, that's the thing. Like, I, I mean, I, I wanted to, show this all it's it's a tattoo on my arm it's live learn pass on that's the whole ethos of what you just said is Can you show that off yeah, to the camera live learn and pass on that's i used to work for elite fts which is an yeah. equipment company it's one of their mottos but it's one of the things that i take really really to heart because the biggest thing to focus about about tom's feet the 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 achievement that he did it's 525 pounds for 23 reps that's that's a lot. That's a crazy that's that's a crazy achievement. But the thing is like I am an all-time world record holder. I am arguably the the like the best squatter on the planet like in powerlifting right now. It, it, like some some people make that argument. I'm not saying it. It's been said. But like I fell short. I wasn't able to do it. Tom didn't train for top end strength. Tom didn't train to do that. He trained to get big ass legs and he still accomplished that. That's crazy. Dude, it I, when when some when I looked at it and I was like, man, I want to do this. I didn't want to do it to beat Tom. I wanted to do it to beat me and to be like, holy shit, that's crazy. Mm. It, it's it's just it's a marvel to me to see that to see someone. We're looking at you right now. Yeah, actually. yeah. This and is this is you coming out of that lift, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Where you where you literally passed out and everybody uh, caught you. Oh, no, this J is Jake. Yeah, yeah. Jake. yeah, yeah. That's Jake. That's not him. Yeah. Uh, he, tell us. He's the mad. He's the mad scientist yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, put put the uh, put me back on uh, the, when you find that clip, tell us. Um, it t I think uh, Joe's kind of on the in the tail end of that clip. You recognize him, glasses, or, or, in, the be or in the beginning. Oh, the beginning. Sure. Yeah. It might be before. You don't have to put him on. Yeah, you, but you but can keep but, it on us. Yeah, but it, but either way, either way. Um, yeah, it is. It, yeah, it was. It it the well, so the one thing that I didn't anticipate or that we didn't anticipate training for this is honestly just how long the set was going to take in general. Because if you actually if you watch the whole attempt, I had five hundred and twenty five pounds on my back for over for, a while. for over three minutes. Just just yeah. just let let's think about this, guys. Think yeah. about this. If you had four or five on your back, 
four plates, which, you know, that's the kind of like the, the gym. You see that in a gym, you're like, that's that, a big lift. That guy's strong. That guy's yeah, strong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hold that on your back for three minutes. At much less squat it. Think of that. <laughs> yeah. So that was one thing that I didn't, that I don't think we anticipated. And, and I think that's one of the reasons All smiles. Why. All right. smiles, you crazy bastard. Gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> he's waving to the crowd. He's, he's kissing babies. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's bleeding yeah. out his ass. But uh, that's another story for another time. Oh, um, but yeah. But, but yeah, it's it like that. When when I do come back to it, and because I will be attempting it again, I haven't put it on the on the actual schedule. But when we do that, all that was there's no like, and, and I've talked about this a million times. I could talk about it with my injury. I could talk about it with all the times I've fallen short of any goal that I have. Like that, that I didn't fail. I didn't fail with that. There was no I failure. Yeah. No, I didn't achieve what I set out to. Yeah. But I learned a load. That's data acquisition. That's me understanding. Hey, I felt I didn't do this. So I got this result because of that, or I did this and I got this result because of that. Now I can use that information and facilitate a bigger victory in the future. It's just learning. I can tell you uh, how crazy this is for everybody who has not watched that that attempt. Um, Is it on your YouTube page? Mm -hmm. So check out uh, Joe Sullivan's YouTube page. You'll be able to see that incredible feat of strength. Uh, but a friend of the show who was on um, on the podcast not but uh, two weeks ago, Mitchell Ooh. Hooper. Yeah. Hooper. Everybody thinks he's getting booed when he when people say <laughs> that. But um, Hooper literally done, I think, 24 reps. Mm-hmm. And you've seen what it took out of him. And this is the world's strongest man. Not that I'm comparing strengths because you're mm-hmm. a freak of nature compared to him in body weight. It's not no question. But mm-hmm. that's the world's strongest man. He is used to training weight, Plus endurance equals. His endurance was tapped. You see him going, and he came out hard for mm-hmm. reps. Mm-hmm. And I think he took a little bit of a break uh, to the tail end, and he got some singles out, if I can remember correctly. But you seen what what uh, what he looked like after that twenty fourth rep. He it hit the shit out of him too. And and obviously, like I said, you know he trains that style every single day, every single week. Um, you just dedicated a period of your time mm-hmm. to doing that. You went from, you know, single lifts, powerlifting style, you know, you know yeah, what I mean? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to, to now jumping into that. Mm-hmm. So I think, my friend, and you will, you and I will speak off camera because we've had this conversation. There is something brewing in the future. Whenever that happens is, uh, suffice to say, you know, I do, don't do things in halves, um, but uh, there will definitely be a event based around the next time you go for this event um, and this lift, I'm sorry. And my goal, I'm going to put it out there, is to uh, bring the legend himself, Tom Platts, because I think if multiple people come in to try to attempt this record and having Tom there yelling, Mm -hmm. what a beautiful thing. Oh, yeah. Not only for the people who are lifting, but for the audience to experience this. Because when Tom attempted this record. It was at an expo. Mm-hmm. I believe it was in FIBO. I'm not too sure, but I know it was at... It's, it, it, was in, at it was in Germany. So it yeah, could have been yeah, a FIBO. Yeah. And, and obviously he, he got up there and... and um, was it a, in a, a set of uh, wraps? Do you have wraps on or I can't remember? I th- I don't know if he had wraps on, but I know he, ha- he had a, like one of the first generation like powerlifting suits on. Mm. So it's like a little bit of supportive equipment, but it's not much compared to what, what, what is today. Got you. So who, kn- who knows? Who knows? But, well, that yeah. would be a goal of mine. Yeah. Um, and uh, my, my producer just uh, politely just told us we, we are way over the hour mark, by the way. I can't believe that, by the way. I, don't, I have we, no idea what the time well, limit how, is for you. How long are we at now, tell us? Where are we at? You are at, oh. You're at uh, hour 20 right now. Hour 20. Oh, my gosh. What, well, when, my, goal, my goal was to, uh, to get a, a 60 to 90 minute podcast. So we're at that point right now, but okay. uh, but, but I but, I can but, keep rolling. I don't we, care. We, if we, are, we are rolling. Okay, there's, a, I, there's a few other things that I would like to talk to you about, which I think are very interesting. Before topics. before we delve into that, because you, I think this is a perfect time for me to say this, because. Um, Flex, the gracious host, just said he doesn't do things in halves, and planning about the uh, planning some type of event that goes into attempting this again. This is what I wanted to talk to you about last week, and I have been put off, I've been putting off having a conversation about it because, oh. like me, I am not, I'm not someone who does things in half measures. It's if I do it, I am doing it all the way, and I'm doing it, I'm doing it 
to win, to to do the best of my ability. To break all time world break records. Break all time world records. Do big shit. Do do big stuff. Do cool things. So uh, I have I have my uh, my next powerlifting meet is the end of October. It's the American Pro. Uh, it's just outside of Washington D.C. It's gonna be great. I'm super stoked for it. I'm plan I'm planning to if everything goes right. Uh, Break, break my world record again and continue to push my total higher, try to get like a top three finish at the meet. There's big cr- prize money and all that stuff, just fun powerlifting shit. But I wanted to talk to you about this because after that powerlifting meet, we were talking about like, Tyus, I was talking to you about how I uh, have, I've overcome my injury. I've actually been able to like train for hypertrophy in my upper body for the first time in six years. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's a very unique thing for me to experience but it put a little thing in my brain my lovely partner is competing in usa's in uh uh, yeah end of july female bodybuilding and women's physique and after the american pro i'm getting to be a little outside of range to making the 220 pound weight class so for 12 to 16 months i'm going to be training specifically for bodybuilding and i'm planning to get on stage in winter of 2024 or spring of 2025, probably either Mark Show or The Cutler. Is this a Joe Sullivan exclusive for the Straight Outta Lair podcast? It's the first time I'm saying Ooh. it. So. so Joe Sullivan is now going to put down the the, uh, the chalk and put on a pair of Spanglies Hell, poison trunks. And a razor, man. Let's I gotta go. I got to get rid of that shit. <laughs> But but That's what, great, man. but but what better what better time like that kind of in conjunction with that I've been because I'm re- I'm really excited about it honestly mm-hmm. I haven't been able to train to actually put muscle on my upper body in God knows how long yeah um, but uh, I, I I think pairing that transition with a little bit more of uh, not not an endurance focus but I'm going to be not training like a power lifter I'm going to be training more akin to like bodybuilding and like the endurance side of things mm-hmm. I think. In that timing, that time frame, that time window, uh, that'd be the perfect time to do another run at this at at this feat. So well, who knows when? But I'm, I'm, I might know a gym that could actually help. Maybe you know keep you in the in the right track. But we'll mm-hmm. speak off the podcast. Yeah, but yeah, no, yeah, all yeah. jokes aside, mate, that's that's great. Yeah, you've been itching, and I've seen this. You've been itching to jump into a bodybuilding show, or, or at least. Closet bodybuilder, I yes, call these guys. Yeah, yeah. We've got a lot of strong men that have been on that have uh, been closet bodybuilders. Um, but you have uh, been doing a couple of cheeky little uh, front double biceps here or there on your mm-hmm. Instagram page. And I was like, this guy, right? You, I see what you're doing. I see I see you, Joe. Yeah. And you've um, obviously, you're, I want to talk about your, your, your better half, Brie, mm-hmm. who is um, an incredible athlete, first things foremost. Mm-hmm. She's had an in, incredible. I uh, hit all the users word, but uh, powerlifting uh, career. And even though she's still one foot in powerlifting now, I don't know if it's the gym, I don't know if it's the environment, I don't know if it's the training partners, but she has competed and won her won her show, the first mm-hmm. ever show. And mm-hmm. from a conversation her and I had at that point in time, she said, and I quote, this shit, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I am not going back. I can't wait to get fat and happy and eat everything and lift a shit ton of weight. End quote. <laughs> I see her in the gym. I look at her and I go, are you dieting again? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> I kind of miss it. I love her, bro. She's yeah, great. I know. It's it's the same story because what, what are we dealing with now? Two weeks out from USA's. Ready to do it, ready to be done with it, talking about we're going to take this <laughs> awesome gonna... off season. I'm going to get fat. It's going to be great. I'm not going to have to worry about this shit. I can be a human, this, that, yada, yada. I can hear a voice coming three, through. Three months. I'm bet, I'm bet money. Three months after this goddamn show, she's going to be like, I could do this, you know, like we could plan that and do this one. And then I could get back into here. It, the, the, she's, we're all the same. We're all addicts, man. We yeah. just can't stop. We got to be doing something cool something fun something stupid like that but i, but I might dude, have to apologize yeah, to you i don't know if yeah. my gym has no, created this no, monster no, man, no but it, we'd, we'd all be doing it anyway man <laughs> yeah. it's just, it's just easier to do it that way because we're all we're around the bodybuilders and it's like oh that seems cool and that the body was around the power lifting yeah, exactly. so i think so it's, that, it's going yeah. in both hands yeah, you know ex- so, exactly but no she's she's doing incredible she's a true dude, 
beacon in this gym. She's, she's such a motivation to so many girls as well as guys, including myself. She, dude, she's she is she's exemplary, like as an athlete and as a person. It's it's awesome to watch her, and this is one of the biggest things that has pushed me to be in a position where it's like, I actually want to try the bodybuilding thing is a, as simple as it is because I, I follow a meal plan. Like as a, as a power lifter, I still eat like an athlete. I have a meal plan. I do the whole thing, but I just have a little bit of leeway, you know, like I can, I can fit this in, fit, fit that in yada, yada, but watching Briani pivot from being a power lifter and having that level of freedom, having to, having to flip the dial for like 10 seconds in the, in the gym, but then unwind it going into bodybuilding where that dial, it's not the intensity dial. It's not like the rage, the, the void, the, the being there in the training, but you always have to be on. You always have to be willing to say no, like, Hey, I'm not going to eat that. Hey, I'm not going to go hang out with these people because it's going to be too late. And then I won't be able to get up for my cardio, yada, yada. It all compounds on, on one another mm. and see like living with her. Cause we both, we, we both own our own business. As we both work from home, work with one another and seeing her day in and day out in spite of the fact of how hungry she is, how tired she is, how exhausted and how over it she is every single day, no matter what, no matter, no, no fail. She chooses to do the thing that is difficult seeing that and seeing that like proof positive in a person up close and personal that's one of the most inspiring things I've ever encountered in my life. And it's like, I've, I've told her this and not just not to this capacity, but it's like, I, t you, you tell your girlfriend like, Oh, you inspire me every day, baby. But it's like, we all say that shit. But in that context, it's mm -hmm. literally as someone who has achieved the highest of the highs in terms of athletic achievement in, in my Avenue, that's the shit that I find impressive. That's the shit that's inspirational to me that makes me wake up and be like, holy shit, I can be better. I'm doing good, but I can do more. I can be better. I, and, and having people like that in your life, whether it's because you train at this gym or live with somebody or meet somebody, that's the shit you got to be grateful for. And it's it's awesome that I mean I'm I'm so goddamn lucky, dude. I get to I, I get to be in a relationship with her. It's great. She pisses me off to no to no <laughs> end when she's in prep, but it's a blast, man. Is so. there is there any uh, anything you can say and throw her on the bus? Like, is she one of these uh, neurotic dieters, or uh, do you, can you are you able to eat? your meals in the same room as her? Because, uh, listen, I know people who have mm -hmm. come from the powerlifting and done the bodybuilding, mm -hmm. and they, they, they it seems like they created their own rules to the game. They come into bodybuilding, it's like, okay, you cannot eat that food in front of me. You have to go to an Don't, if you're going to eat micro, they, somebody bought a microwave <laughs> for the shed. They, they made their significant <laughs> other nuke their food in the shed so they didn't have to smell it. Mm -hmm. Is is Brie any of them uh, characters in the house? She is. <laughs> she's a character, but she's a complete opposite expression of that type of character. The first, it's been better this prep because I've been I've been dieting in solidarity with her. Yeah. I've just been like a hundred percent adherent to my meal plan, which I should be. Mm -hmm. But as compared to last prep, because that was her first bodybuilding season ever. She and in her first season, she won her first show, got fourth at USA. She kicked ass. But one of her coping mechanisms was I called her. So I, I don't know how censored we need to be. We've got software you, that yeah, bleeps yeah, us. But, but, but <laughs> you, like, you, you know what a cuckold is? No. It's a, it's a guy who watches, watches someone else, their girlfriend. Oh, really? And they enjoy it. Oh, like a cuck. A cuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's seen, a cuckold. I, yeah, I've seen a, uh, yeah. Elon Musk call yeah, right? uh, yeah. uh, Jack yeah. a bird of cuck. Exactly. Yeah. So. That not in our house. That's not what we do. But Bree, I was like, "Why are you getting yeah, out nah. with this, bro?" But Bree, but Bree, but Bree, <laughs> that's a sound bite for us, right, right yeah, there. No, no kidding. But Briani is a food yeah. cut. Ah, I got fat, dude. Really? Not, I was actually like that when Ali was pregnant. Yeah, I was dude. feeding her all the time. Yeah, no, dude. And she, she, because she couldn't eat anything. And I mm. was like, back, back. This was her first prep. Was when I was getting ready for the Tom Platts thing. Mm. And I was just, I was, I had to eat like, yeah, I, dude, I like my maintenance calories right now. I'm at like five, like 5,000. But like then I was eating like 7K a day so just to maintain that. my weight. I was just, I was killing myself. But she loves, she, she, her love language is cooking. 
Her love language is feeding people, do like doing things for other people. She made me so much goddamn food. She made me order so much food. She was like, what are you going to get? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not that hungry. She's like, you should get a burger. <laughs> and she would or- get DoorDash on my phone and order food for me and watch me eat it. Because she had, she stuck to her meal plan, and it was just this weird, cathartic way for her to enjoy food and me just eat like a fat. And I got I got a little pudgy. I compete in the two twenty weight class, and I was like, I was in the two fifties. I was like, <laughs> I was a little heavy this off season, guys. Shout so, out to Bree. Yeah, no kidding, man. Well, but my yeah. my brother will attest to this. When um, Ali was pregnant mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Adi. Um, <laughs> my brother was living with me for two years, going to school, mm-hmm. and they became eating partners. <laughs> so I'm dieting for the Mr. Olympia, and I walk, I come into the house, and I'm looking around. It's like uh, I'm going to get my food ready. It's like, what are you guys eating tonight? And um, you know, it's kind of like indecisiveness in the house. I was like, I'm ordering all of you Domino's. And my brother, I can't remember my brother. Oh, not again. <laughs> I would order so much food to the house because my bro- my wife was pregnant for the first time. Mm-hmm. I was like, you eat it for two. You got to eat. Obviously, we learned a lot of lessons from that because that <laughs> she she put on some weight, um, and obviously being pregnant too. And then after the fact, she was oh, I was the arch enemy after the fact because she was like, "You, <laughs> you like, put all this weight <laughs> to me. You did you this. You did me. this. You did this." I was like, "Oh my, I'm so sorry." So this time around, we we done a different approach, but nonetheless, I can relate. Um, but kind of, I would say this is the last topic for the podcast, and and something that um, you know, is very controversial. Um, and, and speaking on the back end of, of Brie and competing and with all these new walk movements and these ideologies and, and bullshit that's going on right now and as a, a dad who has a daughter, um, there's certain subjects that I'm unfiltered on and I want to preface this straight away. This is not me being anti anything i'm sure this will be strung and cut and you know turned into something else but i am anti nothing if somebody wants to live their life a certain way good as long as you're not being me think as long as you're not involving children as long as you're not pushing some nonsense on to somebody or trying to change the the landscape that has been for how many years um, and what I'm what I'm trying to get at right now is trans in sport, and the reason why I bring that up recently in Canada, there was a born male identifies as a woman that competed in a powerlifting show and absolutely obliterated the record. And I sat back and I heard this, and I'm. It just blows my mind. And and just also to preface too, I have a friend who has somebody in a situation that is in transition. and But that person is not in any sport. It's not like a, a boy competing against a girl, uh, etc. In this case, this born male, biological male, identifies as a female, obviously entered this powerlifting show to... Not to make a point, to break these records, the 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 record of this the, of the I think it was the Canadian Canadian Championships, correct? Yeah, it was a C- CPU, CPU. Like bench press only or something yeah. like. Yeah, I don't know how long that record stood, but evidently this lifter wasn't good enough to win anything in the uh, male category. So you know, through identification, threw herself into the mix of um, competing against these females. Now, for me as a dad who has two kids, one male, one female. If my daughter was training for an event, training for a sport, training for whatever, and that was her evident day to day, she lived this lifestyle, just like I did for bodybuilding, and my commitment to that sport, the sacrifice, the dedication, all of the above, and then she was beat by a biological male who identifies as a female, I understand why there's such an uproar. Mm-hmm. I also don't understand why all these federations and all these, um, again, the, 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 the organization, the CPU, are bending the knee, no pun intended there, bending the knee to this ideology and this woke nonsense. Because you are destroying the sport. Not only are you destroying the sport, but you are destroying 
every little girl's dreams to attempt to go for something in life. Like, you think now, how many now females have looked at that and said, well, me, this is the end of my powerlifting career because yeah. now you've, atten- you've now destroyed, destroyed everything that I've trained for, everything that I hoped for, everything because of trying to fit in and try to be, you know, part of this new gen. Mm-hmm. I think it's shameful. Mm-hmm. It's shameful. Sorry, George. It's, I think it's shameful that these people have allowed this to happen. And no pun when I say this, but where the f- your balls to stand up against this nonsense? Mm-hmm. This is nonsense. Uh, if you want to be competitive, let's create a category where everybody can go in. Let's, let's, let's make a, a non-binary identifier as a cat, microwave, female, male, whatever category. But don't ruin the dreams of young girls who are aiming to be the best at something. And then when they're so close, get beaten by a biological male. I, I think it's shameful. And for all these organizations like the CPU and the swimming organization mm-hmm. that has destroyed now a record that was being chased for many years by several different girls, not just one. And then have that girl who complained to be castrated to be meant to, uh, to be felt as if she was in the wrong for, for going for what mm-hmm. she was trying to do and, and achieve is absolutely disgusting. And again, I have no problem about you identifying as a cat, as a, as a, as a microwave. If that's you good. There's actually somebody in my, in my daughter's school, she goes to private school, who, who brought a kitty litter box in because she identified as a cat. I think it's ridiculous. But whatever, right? That's not my kid. My kid understands you know just like most kids i think the the difference between biological and not but if you identify that listen i understand i have a friend that is going through the same thing he's one of the boys i love the kid i actually know the kid grew up but nonetheless when you go into a sport that's where in the line in the sand should be drawn and um obviously as this pertains to your sport there was a somewhat of a uh physical petition that was done and uh you want to tell us about what happened at the cpu so do okay with just to give that more background um it's the the most recent male who identified as a female who competed his name is avi and he did that i don't know i honestly don't know what you know about it because avi silverberg i think his name is Mm -hmm. he broke the record as a form of protest. That's, yes. So to clarify, yeah. I, I left a big mm-hmm. gap in the market there. So yes, so out of protest, mm-hmm. a, a, a Canadian coach of 10 plus years yep. uh, decided to identify as a female. Mm-hmm. And because, again, there's such a, you know, this gray area, um, I hear there was a lot of people like, you're not, you don't, you're not a female. And the guy was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm identifying as a female. So mm-hmm. because of this nonsense rule, they allowed him to compete. And not only did he beat that record that was beaten by biological females, by that other lifter. I don't want to give this lifter a prop, by the mm-hmm. way. Don't give that yeah. name. But then Avi, mm-hmm. respect to him and what he done, he broke that record on by, by a like protest. A hun- by 150 pounds, I think it was. Yeah. Something something crazy. So thank you for adding yeah. that in. But that's yeah. that. I, yeah, didn't, yeah, yeah. Ex- yeah. I didn't mean yeah. that guy. I meant the yeah. previous. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and, but that's, and that's, but the reason that I bring that up is because I've, I've spoken about Avi before uh, on social media. And I, like when I originally talked about him, it's like the way he did it and the way he spoke about it, very crass, very like, it was like bully-esque. And it was like, I felt as though he could go about it in a better way just because I, I'm, I'm probably a lot more progressive than a lot of people would assume because they see me lifting lifting weights and it's like the same thing like I'm this angry guy and they don't want to get in my face but I'm like all smiles and happy like during the thing it, or after immediately after the thing but with 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 this I'm probably a lot more progressive than people realize like I coach a couple trans athletes um and and I have a couple or uh, I have a non-binary member of my family um but the thing about it is as as crass and as rude and as as much of an asshole Avi was, mm. it's right, dude. Just because when you get 
when you get to the thick of it and get to the bottom of it, there are there there's a difference between sex and gender, biological sex and gender. And as harsh and as difficult as those conversations may be, Avi breaking that record and make it, like doing that in that form of protest is the only way that there's going to be some type of change that gets instilled in basically to prepare prepare or or essentially like make those federations take that shit seriously because if Avi wasn't the individual to do it the previous individual who was born a male and then identified as a female would continue to go on and break records that biological females could have every could have every right to break and like a, a girl who's 12 years old could look at that and be like that's what I want to do one day and then to have someone who is different than them in the terms of biological sex break it and then tell them well tough tits you can't you just can't get there <laughs> you know tits. not fuck, I don't know use a bad fuck, I don't know man <laughs> yeah, depending on who you go to ha 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 tough ha, false tits it. yeah right um but uh but yeah it's it, it it's that's the thing when you look at it and look at ter- look at it in terms of actual actual like biological development and like when someone as a male goes through male puberty there are th- there are ep- things that change on the epigenetic and genomic level that are uh, like you can't undo that it's the same it's the same idea as when someone take like let's say someone is a drug tested competitor and then they take performance enhancing drugs. They take they do a couple of steroid cycles or something along those lines. That person can come off of that of those performance enhancing drugs and they won't get as much of an acute benefit as they would if they stayed on them, but there are things that change on the cellular on the cellular level, on the biological level like in the muscle cells that cannot be undone. It's the same type of thing that happens when those epigenetic changes occur when someone goes through male puberty in terms of bone density, in terms of contractile strength with the muscles, in terms of endurance, in terms of red blood cell uh, composition. There's a million different things that can occur that are just scientifically different. And until the CPU or any other powerlifting federations begin to consider those things or other any other govern, governing body like WADA or, or whatever starts to understand, like take a step. And that's, that's the takeaway here for me is taking a step back and stopping just reacting based on feeling because ultimately so much of this stuff is it, it I don't want to say it's an overreaction, but I feel like it's getting to be an overreaction because everybody is worried so much about offending some individual or hurting some individual or making them feel different in, in a certain way. And no one wants to do that. We all want acceptance and an inclusivity and all of these great things. And, and dude, so do I, As do I, I. like I, I, I have transgender friends. I have non-binary friends, people in my family. Like I said before, I want all of them to feel just as valid as a human as I do. But sometimes, and this is where it gets into the really difficult conversation type of thing, and my, my thoughts and my beliefs are, are constantly like either being changed or developed or I'm, I'm just, I, you think about it differently as you age. I agree. But sports and competition and phys- like physicality, mm. physical strength and physical ability, that's the one thing where there's not any room for fairness, honestly, because like Flex, you're, you're an incredible bodybuilder. You, you are one, like the most, most achievingest or whatever, the 212 on, on the planet. But if Mitchell Hooper looked at you and said, hey, man, you know, you could go win World's Strongest Man, You'd be like, no, I, I cannot. No, I cannot. I can try my hardest. Mm-hmm. I can live my dream. I, I can go after these goals. But it is not feasible for me to do that because I do not have the size. I do not have the height. Mm-hmm. They would tell you, put, put this 300-pound stone over a bar that's 66 inches, and you're like, that's my forehead. What are you <laughs> talking about? Just because, just because World's Strongest Man has that stipulation when it comes to the rules mm. and because you may feel as though that you've been slighted because of that height disadvantage, it doesn't mean that they have to change those rules. It doesn't mean that they have to change that, the, the height requirement. Mm. It's the nature of the sport, and sports aren't fair. Physical achievement isn't fair. I wish my arms were longer so I could deadlift more. I wish I could 
get rid of the remnants of this nerve injury. I wish I never experienced it, but I can't wish those things into reality. Mm. And it's harsh to say that to some individual because it, to, to some individuals because it causes these really difficult, shitty feelings to happen. But sports aren't fair, and I like. I still think Avi is kind of an asshole, cause, mostly just because I know his like social media presence and like the stuff he posted about it. But on paper, he showed just exactly how broken the rules are mm. because this, the problem was the CPU put a policy in place where there was no there was no accompanying uh, like therapeutic use like through a doctor that had to be proven. It was literally as if someone like if you walked up there and you were like, my name is Fiona Lewis. I am going to compete as a female. That is all you had to, all you had, had to, to do. do. There was no stipulation, so yeah. he showed exactly how wrong that was. It shined a light on on and, a a a rule that needs to change. And, basically. and that's the thing, shit. Yeah. If if it's that glare, if if it can be that glaringly yeah. insane, it needs to change. It's like the red pill, right? It's like the you're exposing the matrix to the the, the nonsense that's going on. For me, I don't care. You know, we're not talking about uh, the people living their lives here. We're talking about sports. I just mm-hmm. want to make sure this is known because I don't want to sound like that cliche. Oh, I've got friends that are gay. And that, yeah. when you start saying that, then people are like, oh, you're already saying that. It's like, you see who I hang out with. I support everybody. We have all walks of life that come into this mm-hmm. into this gym. All walks of life, all people who identify for whatever. But when it comes to a sport and you are going to take somebody's First, second, third, podium place away from them. That that to me is wrong. And if you were so passionate about competing in a sport, then either do one or two things instead of fighting the you know the uphill battle of trying to prove that you feel like a female, therefore you should compete against females. Why don't you then either compete or create a class that is open to everybody, open to the genre that you want to compete in, or Jump in with the biological males that as you as you were born. Now people are gonna fight me on this and, and they're gonna say I'm an asshole for saying this, but unfortunately, and maybe these people don't have kids. Now I'm a dad, I understand this more than anything because I see, you know, knowing what I've put into this, now knowing that as I'm a dad and seeing what, what my daughter truly loves and, and to have something stolen away from her when she's committed her life to it, I couldn't imagine. So um, in kind of wrapping this topic up, because this is a kind of like a, a, a rabbit hole of, uh, of of conversation that we kind of won't win on. This is a this is more of a a subject that normally, if this was brought up, or oh, it's a trending topic or it's cool to talk about, I kind of don't want to do that. You know, we 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 on this podcast more so preach about the the success of people, the mindset that got you there, etc. But you know, as this is kind of fresh of pa- fresh paint in your in your sport right now um i just want to get your take on it and also give yeah. you mine and um i hope you know as as life goes on that these people who are competing in these different federations find their peace because right now i don't know if these people are doing it in their own version of protest because there's there's truly no win you yeah. might be l- having your hand lifted up in glory but then you wake up that next morning with a backlog mm-hmm. and a an abundance of hate. Yet you are only trying to seek validation, success through ch- achievement, whatever it is. But you're not getting it in the route you're going. So I don't know how that is achieved. I'm not the guy, not the one for the answer. But these organizations, instead of allowing this this to, to bleed in, this leftist nonsense that's coming in now from nowhere. It's like post-COVID. What happened during COVID for all these things to come out? And um, and, and again, all these, these uh, walk practices, we now need to, you know, take heed and say like, hey, this is wrong. And instead of ca- being castrated for actually saying, hey, this is wrong, understand what people are saying. This is wrong because... Because... You're stealing the dreams of little girls. You're stealing the dreams of athletes who have dedicated their life since being a little girl or since committing themselves to a sport that they love and, 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 and give their life to sacrifice, lose time from their family, lose hours of their life 
to then turn up at a competition, look to their left, be surrounded by, you know, the people that they've competed against that have pushed them genuinely, whether beaten them in the past or they, or they, you're the, the you're the queen of that class, mm-hmm. to then have somebody who just on Tuesday did uh, decided to identify as male and then take the whole class mm-hmm. or sport or whatever it is, and and that's my part, that's my piece. I have no disrespect for anybody in that community. My mindset is stay in your lane. That's it. And I think I think the difficult thing that you're going to experience and that I'm I'm going to experience and anyone experiences when they talk about a topic like this is exactly what you described. It's when COVID happened, people what what for whether it was the lockdown or whatever, but they got put into a position where people can't have conversations anymore. And I know it sounds like such boomer, like old head shit, where it's like, oh, nobody talks to anybody anymore or whatever. But think about it. Like you said, this is not a good idea because. And anyone who says anything negative about your opinion or my opinion on the on this podcast, they're not going to put out that thought with the intent to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. They're going to put out what they believe to shit on you, to shit on me, and they don't want to hear anything back. They're mm-hmm. not willing to have that conversation. And even the individuals who support like just blanket inclusivity uh, uh, like anybody identify as anybody Mm. in any sport like i could go be a female and squat 850 pounds break that record cool great Mm. that anyone who supports that when you say hey maybe that's not a good idea they don't want to hear the explanation they Mm. don't want to hear the logic they don't want to hear the rationale they don't want to have a discussion they just want to call you a bigot and a piece of shit and to shut the fuck they put you in a category and and that and that's the problem that's that's the issue with all any any topic we could cover these days. I so. just don't understand also where the feminists are because there was all these feminists march about women empowerment and, and and this and that and there's a lot of people that might identify with being a feminist but then when it came to actually truly understanding what that really means, you're, you're there to empower women, you're there to to to, under, to make women equal, right? Or There's so many different variables, right? But I'm saying in 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 this case right now, you... Because somebody identifies as such, you are allowing that person to now align with your feminist mindset. That is a female. It, it, I just can't get my head around that. I'm sure there's, there's feminists out there that, are, that there's an internal battle. But again, listen, I, I, I don't want to put and give this any much more love than it already has. Um, but with that said, I, I feel like our our ideologies are, are, are aligned here um in shifting topics that's a very hard to ship from you um <laughs> and in closing up the podcast we are now coming up to two hours by the way and uh this is kind of the longest podcast i've done for a while um <laughs> but nonetheless it's been incredible to have you on the podcast we we definitely have much more topics to cover but that's one topic that i, I kind of uh wanted to you know well I wasn't expecting to talk about, but we ended up talking about. But, um, Joe, as you and I know, you have a training session coming up. I am yeah. actually a, uh, I'm filming in uh, 15 minutes. Actually, I can see the film crew that's standing outside my door. What is next for you? What do you want to push? What do you want to promote? The floor is yours. The camera is there. Tell your fans what's going on in the world of Joe, and we'll sign out. Well, first off, thank you, Flex. Thank you, Tyus. Thank you to Allie. Thank you to the Dragon's Lair. I'm super glad and honored to be here, be a part of this, be on the podcast, and just train here. It's awesome. So thank you. Uh, But firstly, I have my competition coming up. Uh, It's the American Pro 2. It's hosted by the WRPF. It's in the end of October. I'm going to be posting my training. going to be doing the whole thing. going to be trying to break my all-time world record again uh, for the fifth time and and do it in big fashion. Uh, But... Currently, uh, myself, Jake Benson, and Andy Triana, we're uh, writing a book. Uh, Don't have it titled yet, but we will be releasing it this fall. It's essentially our own approach uh, to to training and how to incorporate bioenergetics into training, like what uh, Tyus and I were talking before the podcast, but basically like understanding biology and biochemistry and basically putting it 
putting it in more simpler terms, meathead terms, to understand why someone would do something with their training to get this certain result. We have a book coming out this October. Stay tuned for that. Uh, I don't use social media other th- other than Instagram. So just uh, I'm Joe Sullivan underscore AOD on Instagram. The name of my coaching business is the Adapt or Die Collective. You can guess and understand why it's called Adapt or Die based on everything that we've said <laughs> on this podcast. It's the AOD Collective.com. I'm easy to find on social media. It's Joe Sullivan. If anybody has a question or anything like that, hit me up. I love I, I love helping helping people. It's the reason I have the tattoos that I do. Uh, I will re- I respond to all my DMs and all my emails. It just might take me a month if I get to it. But appreciate you guys having me. Um, I'm really fortunate to be here. In a lot of ways, I mean that. So uh, thanks, dude. Well, before we kind of sign sign off. In the in the last minute of this uh, running the clock, I uh, I myself and Ali, um, as I said, a, a, a privilege to have you at the gym. You've done more than uh, well, you've done more than any other powerlifter has ever done in this gym. Physically, we all know that, but as uh, a member of this gym, you've truly given up your own time. You've been your one. We've been loading, unloading stuff. You've done a lot of stuff. And uh, for all the viewers that are listening to this podcast and watching this, you are a payer member, right? Mm-hmm. You, you've been and supported the gym since the get-go. Today that ends. Me and Ali are going to be looking after you and Bree. We're sponsoring you for not only um, your gym membership, but we're going to be looking after you going into this year's uh, World Championship. So we'll talk on off the podcast what that looks like, but this is a gift from me to you for your loyalty, and you know how big I am on that. It's earned, not given, and you guys have earned your right to me now call a VIP at this gym. So thank you for all you've done for me, and let's rock and roll, my boy. Thank you, dude. That's awesome, man. Absolutely. Thank you. There we go. Well, that's Joe Sullivan, the all-time world record holder, also now a VIP here at the Dragon's Light Gym. (laughs) Flex Lewis, Strudel Delaire, two hours in, we are out.